Welcome to Christopher Vision and thank you for coming. I know we've got a lot of experience in the audience, so we're going to tap on that as well. Um, the talk today on making IP uh, ST2110 systems work, in the advertised uh, text we talked about some of the problems that you might have and how they're solved, but we're also going to look together at a system we have here to try and put a more optimistic slant on it. But uh, I was going to start with, if you don't mind, raising some hand to try and see what experience people have, whether people have used these systems. So um, is there anyone here that has already planned or put together uh, an IP system? Peter, yes, DB guys, good to you, yeah. Sorry, where, where are you from? Associated Press. ITV, yep. Yeah. Oh. Associated Press. Associated Press. Oh, cool, Peter. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we do have some experience that could. Um, for most of these, I was going to speculate that there's been a single supplier of software and hardware. Is that true, or has anyone done one with more than one supplier of things? So it's mainly single suppliers. Uh, that was my understanding of what was going on. Um, is anyone not familiar with what 2022 and 2110 is? So, good, because we're not talking too much about what the standard is. We're assuming everyone knows that. Um, if you're not, you know, in detail, it's the, the IT issues are fairly general, but in principle for my way of talking, 2022 is SDI chopped into packets and 2110 has separate media streams of video, audio, and anything else. Um, but as we carry on, anyone still doing SDI installations? We likely to see you on, yeah, a few nods. So we're still supplying SDI kit. So we think that's that going. Um, anyone who hasn't done an IP system that thinks they will in the next two years? Oh, yeah, good. Oh, several, good. Okay, so obviously you know quite a lot, so do chip in wherever you feel you can add to what we're saying or you want to question it. So, um, I'm not sure this is relevant. We also, why are we going to use IP? It's flexible. We can put all the different media types we want down a single wire. We can add things. We can go more resolution. We can have lower resolution for sending it for over the top of phones. Um, and everyone's making IT equipment and we can, though us broadcast engineers have got to become IT experts, there's IT experts that can tell us how to do it properly. Um, cost will be lower, possibly aren't yet. Um, it might be that the IP devices we use aren't standard, but the standard ones available as well if we can put them in our system. And why not to use it? Need different engineers? Well, that's up to us, isn't it? If we can retrain, it'll be the same engineers. If not, it'll be different engineers. <laughs> but uh, it needs uh, people understand IT. Um, networks, if you don't understand them, are complicated. But they're only complicated because they allow huge flexibility and you can set them up in ways that have big advantages. Um, there's some specific technical issues, monitoring the content and security. Uh, that we'll be talking about later. And IP possibly costs more at the moment, certainly the way it's been done with uh, big, very expensive switches. Anyone else got any other suggestions, things that really should keep us with SDI? Um, it's just OPEX costs. It's basically the same as number one, that, that um, I mean, generally in terms of staffing, um, it's, it, if you kind of roll out an IP OB, um, you go to best case, you have to be staffing it with IT people and engineers for the beginning because you won't be able to find that as skills straight away because effectively the skills are going to come after the technology has been installed. So there's going to be that steep learning curve from the beginning, but there's going to be that gap, that time gap at which point you have to, there's going to be a sudden peak in the OPEX cost, which is something that's often not brought up by uh, the install sort of side of th uh, the install side of stuff because. Uh, it's one of the most important things for the client to realise that at, at the beginning these, these OPEX costs are just going to suddenly 
increase without them really being educated about it. And there's nothing you can really do about that from the beginning. It'll settle down when the skilling comes across, but the OPEX cost for the client at the beginning is going to be higher. And that's a good point. And actually, there's a project where I was talking to a national broadcaster. It was time to update one of the regions. And because the nation hadn't gone to IP, they weren't prepared to do it for a region because they thought that they didn't know enough to enable their region to do it without the help. It, just, it was st completely a staffing issue for that one. So, yeah. I'll try and remember to put that in next time. That's a good one. Um, and what I wondered, if we didn't have SDI now, I don't think we'd have bothered, would we? It's only there because we've had it in the past. Anyone disagree? Is it fundamentally good? You think it is fundamentally good? Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it evolved. Yeah. It all evolved over time. Yeah. It was new. Yeah. No, I, I think that's my thought, that SDI is a follow-on from analog to follow-on from video. And it kind of feels like it's just about time to start again. So, um, OK. So we're, we're enthusiastic about IP. So um, to say what we're going to do, we're talking a little bit about a small system here. I'm not going to say too much because Richard will, but in um, part two, we were talking about particular things that you want to be careful of in an IP system. But to try and get rid of the negativity, we put together a system here. Um, we've got, in fact, some very low cost things. We've used ubiquity switches, which cost us £450 for, uh, um, I can't remember how big they are, 24 port, 10 gig switches. So things can be done on the small side and all sorts of budgets. And um, yeah, so, so, so I've put it a bit tongue in cheek, easy to install by a television engineer. The television engineers that are gonna keep their jobs, it will be easy to install by. <laughs> um, we've put a number of our products in and um, the control, I meant to say earlier, thanks to uh, Roddy and Ephraim from Rescular have put some control systems, uh, control system together. And the point we're making is that it isn't that much different from SDI. It controls, in this case, we're not following new standards. We're using our standard protocols. Um, and we're using the switches we happen to own. The, uh, the Netgear and Ubiquiti were bought because they were low cost and we thought we'd find out how they are. And as it is, that's what we use for demonstrations and things. So that's me. Over to Richard. <laughs> Thanks. Good evening. OK, so as Phil was saying, we've just put together a, a sort of reasonably small system. We've made it slightly artificially complex, just to say that it's not noddy simple. Um, but it's also, we were aware that a lot of people seem to think that when you move to IP, that involves not so much single supplier, but huge control system control, not only in terms of the, um, the video infrastructure, but also the networking. And that seemed to imply high cost switches, high cost control, and all of a sudden what seemed to be what we think should be the same cost or hopefully lower cost seem to be hugely high cost. So we thought, okay, what we do is, can you just use low cost switches, you know, say they're 400 pounds, I think I've got the prices of, yeah, range, we've, we use three different switches just because we want to use three different types and they range from price from 33 pounds a port to 145 pounds a port on the net gear. So not particularly high cost. We're not using um, advanced networking control. This is not a software defined network. We are simply using multicast controlled via IGMP, which is a standard network protocol. It is not industry, our industry specific. It's been around for a while. All of these switches, even including the 400 pound one, supported it. All I had to do was turn on a little box that says, please use it, and that's about as much configuration I've done. Finding that box was quite hard, I have to be honest, <laughs> but it was just one box. Um, and yes, we've used multicast only because everyone's using multicast. In many 
instances actually unicast would be more sensible in, in especially in this demo we've actually got there's some of the the feeds you can see they're actually only going from one one sender to one receiver but we've kept everything multicast just because we're aware people in the industry seem to be doing that exclusively at the moment um, so that's our network IGMP is it brilliant reasonably brilliant um, but there are some issues so the way that IGMP works is that a sender is always sending and it goes to the next switch and that switch learns whether anybody else in the system wants to listen to that feed. So it's, it's receiver controlled. So a receiver says, I want to listen to this flow. And it sends out a message, a join message in IGMP and each switch learns about that and eventually the sender gets to learn about it and his packets get to the receiver. If you change from listening to one feed to another, there will be times where essentially both lots of packets come to you. So you do need to ensure your network is, has enough bandwidth available to hand, handle these transition points. If it was completely controlled, from the sender's point of view, you know, to shut up because no one's listening to you, you can overcome that. But that raises the bar of complexity. And the point of this demo is to show how to have low complexity, but you've got to be aware of the bandwidth. Uh, yeah, as I say, the switches choose how they make that connection. And what this means is that control is distributed. There's no need to have a central controller because all you do is, as a receiver, you say, I want to listen to. And how you're told to do that is outside the network control. You still need control. You'll have a central control system that will say, mm -hmm. you know, this output channel now needs to camera feed five or camera feed six, but it's configuring the receiver not dynamically reconfiguring the network. So that to me is a lower complexity system, but it is distributed in its nature. So this little um, demo, what we've got is we've got um, six of various of our cards. We've got cards that do SDI to IP, IP to SDI and we've got these IP to IP cards and they allow us to do protocol conversion or delays or change profiles. For, the, for this demo I'm just really using them as a way of routing traffic around in a bit more of a complicated way just to not quite show an, an artificially silly scenario to show that it all still works. So all we're doing is we're going to have some feeds come in here and they go out there and actually they bounce through these guys and then come up and these two feeds come in here, bounce through these guys and go out from there and what we're going to do is be able to change which feeds these listen to. So that's it in high level concept. How the network is actually wired together, we have a rack in there which has got um, six cards in, which is locally going to a ubiquity switch, which is all housed in the rack. It then has got an uplink, which goes through the building to our server room, the other side of the building. And in there, I've just, say artificially, I've made them go through three different switches to then go to another rack, which actually is located in the server room as well and that's where these IP cards are located. So the video that you're seeing there actually starts off life as an SDI source in this rack. The network packets are going all the way up to here to that IP IP gateway we've got. That just turns the corner, sends all the data all the way back again to the IP SDI card and eventually it comes out on the monitor. Clearly that little journey is daft, it serves no purpose, 
but it's just to show that we can send data through four switches and essentially there's no latency. The, each link to the Dell and to the Ubiquiti is just using the standard 10 gig um, connection, but it's because we need more bandwidth between the various switches, each of those has got 40 gigabits connection. And that's been done not by using a higher cost 40 gigabit fiber link, we've just link aggregated four fibers together. And again, these low cost switches support that. As it happens, the Dell does also support a 40 gig connection, but I've not used that. I've just simply used link aggregation. And again, all I had to do for that was wire it all up, go into the switch and say, these four ports, join them together, look as if it's one port. It was a very simple configuration. It was different on the different switches. They've got different user interfaces, but they're all called the same thing, link aggregation. So once you learn that term, you know where to look. So that's how the network is organized. The control of the network, for that we have a rascular system, uh, which is also linked to this control panel. And what that's doing, that's talking to our frame, and the frame talks to the card using um, a web-based protocol, HTTP, using Johnson um, data format. And what that's going to do is tell the receiver, stop, did I say Johnson? Jason. Yeah. <laughs> I can see, hey, what's he talking about? <laughs> Johnson, Jason, yes, Jason. Um, so um, what that's going to do is going to tell the receiver, rather than listen to this multicast group, listen to that multicast group. And what the card will then do is send out an IGM message. It will leave the group it's currently looking at, and then it would join the new multicast group, receive the packets as video, send it via SDI, comes out to a screen. So this is probably not going to work because it's a live demo. There you go, it worked. Oh, that was a little flashy there. But there you go, so it did work. This is all in development, caveat, caveat, caveat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, you can see that it worked. What we found, people have wondered or worried that by using IGMP, does it take a long time in order to make that switch? Everyone always wants to know a number. So finally, yesterday, I got round to actually measuring it. It does vary, maximum of about 38 milliseconds. I've seen it go down as low as 12. What I did find is it took longer for the software to reconfigure our card and to be told the message from here than it did to actually do the network inside of the switch. So you know, for me as a development engineer, the fact it took time to do the software side means I've still got work to do. But from the network point of view, you know, say at the most it was 38 milliseconds. When I first did the measurement, it was up to 300 milliseconds. And I thought, what's all that about? And that was actually, I'd not configured the switches correctly. You know, I said I'd turned on IGMP, um, there's a protocol called snooping that you have to turn on. I hadn't turned it on in all four switches. One of them had not been turned on. It all still worked, but bizarrely, it then took an extra 200 milliseconds for those packets to flow. I don't know why. It's one of the things on my list to figure out. Um, <laughs> Because I simply, once I'd found it on the switch, it all then went back to normal. Because, you know, I was expecting tens of milliseconds, not hundreds. So my little life lesson from that is that if you do see something that's unusual, more often than not, it's because you've not configured it properly. Not because fundamentally it doesn't work. So, yes, that is our simple system. It demonstrably works. And that will scale up. You know, I'm not aware of anything in this system that wouldn't scale. So to me, IGMP, keep it simple, 
does actually keep it simple and it works. So I'm, I don't know whether I'm preaching to myself and I'm already converted, I'm not quite sure. So um, yes, there we are. <laughs> um, great, glad that worked. Um, <laughs> I can relax now. Okay, so that's a demo. Yes, it works. Um, more general topics is I'm just going to cover, hopefully reasonably quickly, um, issues about security, firewalls, compatibility, monitoring. Again, these topics are just issues that we hear about and hopefully I'll say something that will be you'll find useful. Security. To be honest, I think the last line is the one. It's no real different to SDI. I think there's a perception that because it's on the network, somehow it's infinitely either harder or you're way more open to attack. I don't really think that's the case. SDI is equally as insecure as networking, just that no one does because no one knows about it. That's not to say that there is no issue, clearly there is, but it comes down to like control. Control of SDI already is done via networking. Control of an IP system will be done via networking. So the security aspects are no different. So if you need to secure your control, which clearly you do, you need to be doing that in the SDI domain just as much as you do in the IP domain. The data though, yes, clearly also goes over an IP network. So there is security aspects of that in that you need to start securing your switches far more than what you may have done previously. So previously if your, your network infrastructure was not secure, you might lose control but hopefully the system will still carry on going. If you lose your, um, your switching now, you will potentially lose the data. So the bar yes is raised from there. But to be honest, I would hope that previously you'd be trying to secure your network infrastructure because you wouldn't want to lose control. So again, in my head, there's no real difference. The scale of it is, might be different because you'd have a lot more switches if all of your information is over data. Um, and as I say, how do you solve these things? Well, same way, multi-layered, largely an IT issue. Multi-layered in the sense that you try and secure each individual device and then monitor if that device is doing anything unusual. So it's not only defend against attack, but more often these days is actually monitor that something, and I say attack, something's gone wrong, it's been misconfigured. Yes, you might be under attack, but it's often you really just misconfigured something. Um, you know, like say this multicast example, if I all of a sudden put 100 listeners on the system, potentially there might be 100 times more data going to places that I didn't expect. And so we'd need to monitor what's going on um, that would give us a clue far more than trying to constantly defend. So, security. Firewalls. Just IT firewalls still have their place and you know they are filtering out packets. They allow you to restrict what traffic goes through and also do some monitoring. Media firewalls is something like so like a IP IP gateway because it is understands media we could call it a firewall so what it's able to do is if main and protect signals are going into it we would only maybe decide only send a single flow coming out that we know is protected by some definitions in here that's a firewall two two bits of data are coming in one is coming out. We are filtering two streams and one coming out. We may also want to filter on each of these flows has a, an identifier. And it's just a number 
but as a facility you would manage those numbers. You might decide that you've got many, many multicast groups going on, but you only want to see flows 1 to 10 in this facility. Now a standard IT firewall probably won't be able to do that level of filtering because it requires you to look inside every packet. A media aware firewall would be able to do that level of filtering for you if you feel as if it's necessary. So things currently aren't really called media firewalls but they're doing that type of job. I would imagine when the marketing boys get involved, they'll certainly decide, oh, we're going to start calling this a media firewall. Um, I'm not really aware of too many people that do that at the moment. I say our gateway to gate IP to IP device, we don't call it a firewall, but I say in preparing for this talk, it's fairly obvious we could have branded it a firewall and it, under most definitions, would be that. Yes, lovely compatibility. The thing about IP, there's a protocol for every day of the week and then there's a profile for every hour of every day of the week. And you need both. So as, as an example in 2110, there's a protocol that describes how you send audio from one device to another device. But there's also a little thing called a profile that describes within that protocol whether we put 20 audio signals in every packet and send it out every 125 microseconds or whether we put more samples and send them less frequently. So this all under the umbrella of the protocol but it's called a profile because you're saying I'm going to use that bit of the protocol, that bit and that bit, put it together like this and call it profile, my favourite one. And another company will say, well actually no, in our particular instance we have a profile A. Two different manufacturers may only implement A or they may only implement my favourite one. They're not going to talk, yet they do still conform to the same protocol. So when you're coming to specify in these systems, it is not good enough just to say support this protocol. You do need to specify what profiles within that protocol is. Um, no different from embedded audio at the moment. Yes, exactly the same. It's very you've got to be precise. Um, another example of profiles is um, traffic shaping, <coughs> narrow and wide. Um, timing. So that's the ability that if you're sending out video, you can either send out all the packets evenly spaced, spread out over the frame period, or you send them all out quickly at the start to get them out as fast as possible. Now from the sender's point of view, not really much different, but from the receiver's point of view, that means they've got to have buffering. If they're all coming in really fast, they've got to have some form of buffering. So some devices only support narrow profile, narrow being the one that they're spaced out. Um, and again, yet they both conform to the same protocol. But it's just one line in the spec that says, you can either do narrow or wide, senders should really support both, sorry, receivers should really support both, senders have a choice. If you were being a little bit lazy, shall we say, as a manufacturer, you might say, well, because our sender only does one profile, we'll make our receiver only do the matching profile. <coughs> we're fully conformant, we meet the spec, and of course you plug it into somebody else, and actually you don't. So again, those sort of things, there's nothing new about this. You know, IP protocols have these issues all the time. Um, it's just where we are with the current standards. Um, as I said, choices with profiles don't help compatibility. They give you flexibility because these profiles haven't just been made up to make our lives difficult. Someone has decided that, no, that profile is better in this scenario and this profile is better in that scenario. So they do have uses. Well, I hope they have uses. Um, yes, IP to IP devices solve these problems. So, you know, us as a... a Glue interface manufacturer, that's where we think we can add value. You know, we provide these IP device devices 
to overcome all of these problems. Sales pitch. Mm -hmm. right. Monitoring. So currently with SDI, we monitor, generally we monitor the, the quality of the picture and various things like, is it black, is it frozen, um, is there any audio present or has that also gone silent? In the IT world, they also have standard ways of monitoring things. They tend to be at the packet-based level. Packet and port. So on a given port, you can say how many packets are flowing per second, what sort of bandwidth is that, um, utilisation of the device in terms of its processing, but also of each of its ports. And there are various standard protocols to extract that information. Traditionally, it was SNMP, which is quite slow. Further now, there's things like SFlow and NetFlow, which give you more information, more real time, and also describe, they try to join together packets into flows, but it is still very packet based and very general. And so it's available off the shelf, there's nothing new there. What's new going to be coming along and is now is media statistics. So that's where if you've got knowledge of what the traffic actually is, you can give more useful information. So for example, if you've got main and protect flows, you might want to know, are all the main packet, the packets arriving for the protect packets? Because if they're going through different routes on your network, it might be um, useful information to know, are those two routes actually taking the same time? But probably more significantly, has it changed? Because if it's changed, that might tell you that your network has reconfigured itself and you probably need to know that. So we have um, some statistics here. So again, one of the flows has got main and protect. And as you can see, uh, sorry, I'll go to here. Currently we're using just under 45% of the packets are from the protect. So what that's telling me is, because in our network, I've actually done main and protect, not via separate routes. It's all going through the same infrastructure. Give or take, half are from main and half are from the protect. The skew is how fast the protect packets are arriving ahead of the main packets. And as you can see, it's flopping around, was it minus five, minus 83, that's nanoseconds. Um, and then we've got the gaps between the packets. And again, you can just see that both in terms of the main and the protect flows, the gaps are the same, give or take. The reason why there's a minimum gap and a maximum gap that's so large is that on this particular flow, I'm using the wide profile. So that's the one that says, send out all the packets as fast as possible, which means they're all gonna be butted up, hence the minimum gap of roughly a microsecond. And then once they stop, there's gonna be a large gap until you get the next one. And that's why there's a maximum gap of roughly 28 milliseconds. So if I'd switch this to the narrow profile where they're evenly spaced, I'd have expected min and max gap to be you know, roughly the same because you'd expect the gaps to be the same. Um, but this is to show that you know, we've got a wide transmitter going into a receiver that can receive wide or narrow um, with statistics. And also we indicate how many lost packets and how many duplicated packets. Ours is a network where we would not expect to lose anything. Um, so good that it's zero. Duplicated packets would be, if we started getting those, that would be telling us that we've got a packet probably going around in a circle somewhere. Because again, we would not ever expect to see the same packet twice. Um, we did have a lot of duplicated packets um, when we, again, when we misconfigured our network, we had a monitor, normally a packet, as it goes through switches, can't last forever, because there's a time to live value, and it knocks it down, and eventually the packet says, no, I've been through enough hops, I'll throw it away. 
what we had done is we'd actually configured our network to have a mirror port, mm -hmm. which means don't do that processing, send it out, and we plugged it into the wrong place, and these packets spam around forever. So the duplicate count went somewhat high. <laughs> At least it would have done if we'd had this working before we'd actually done that as a problem. All we had found is that the network went incredibly slow. Um, if we'd had that, we would have actually found that problem sooner. Um, but yes, there we go. Um, right, so uh, that's back to, yeah, back to them. That one. Brilliant. Now, if I can, back over to Phil, talking about synchronisation. Oh, OK. Roll SDI, then, gets to talk about synchronisation. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, I was given the promise with IP that we didn't care anymore, that um, you put a timestamp on all your sources, and then you could, when you got to the output, see when the audio was... Uh, to arrive when the video was, put the appropriate delays in, and it'd be perfect. And um, in your cloud, you could do whatever you want. Um, in fact, it hasn't quite worked like that. The way the 2110 standard is, it relies on the RTP timestamp, which is all right. It gives you a 10 hour or so cycle. But unfortunately, it's only for each link. So you get the timestamp out of the camera, that's great, you know where the picture came from. Put it through a board, does something to it, and then it starts again. It timestamps with what the time of day is now. So you haven't really gained anything. And so when it comes out the system, all you know is what time it entered the last link, which is disappointing. And if the standard is written differently in the future, we may get past that. Um, so, I'm doing, obviously you can see my short, talk's going very short because I haven't got much more to say, is that we end up with exactly the same with SDI. Um, timing isn't any more of an issue than it is with SDI. Each box, well, we've ended up doing our boxes very similar to the SDI ones. You say, what do you want the output timing to relative to your reference? And that can be RTP or it can be... Um, uh, analog syncs and do I say RTP? PTP? Mm -hmm. PTP or analog syncs and it will create a reference and the delay through certainly our units is, is predicted and controlled. Um, you will get some products that are very short delay and that you could ignore and you'll get some products that are quite long delay and you'll have to know what they are and put video delays in. Um, so things that are good on IP timing that we thought might be bad are that it's actually very quick, nothing takes long to go through, and there's no real reason why processing should take any longer. Um, and the other thing, as Richard hinted at, rather than taking, if you've got something that's taking a whole frame to develop it, and rather taking a frame to send that frame to somewhere else that's going to do a frame calculation, you could do it really fast with your wide um, distribution of packets. But at the moment, people are saying they want narrow, and so that's what they do. So we're ending up with a system that is no better and no worse than SDI, which is... It's okay, but it's not as good as it should be. So I don't think, apart from the fact that you need equipment that works and you need PTP timing and in some cases you want your switches to cope with it, that it's much different. I guess where the differences come is in SDI, your clock is, only, is at the same speed at the data and every clock you've got some data and you want that clock to be absolutely solid. Whereas in IP, you've got a clock that's much faster than the data and you send it, um, you know, we have a time stamp when it wants to go and that's when we send it. So it's not locked in the same way that with SDI, you've got to take your PTP, which is an IP derived things, uh, sorry, for an SDI output from an IP system and generate the old fashioned SDI clock, which 
I guess you then get, to, I guess the more you look at IP, the more SDI say, well, the clock rate's the same as the data rate. Seems, it seemed obvious at the time, but when you haven't got it, I, I don't know why you should. And I'm from equipment manufacturer. It's sort of different as well. I guess we've got different people <coughs> doing it, but for SDI, the clock internally worked at exactly the speed that the data came in. You did chunt, 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 you did clock did things and it came out the other end. Whereas in our kind of software GPU system, you get the things in and they need to be processed at a certain time. You process them really quickly and then you stop and then you go on to process another media stream. So it's different, but I'm not convinced that it is from a system integration all that different unless you start using new opportunities of either sending the messages quicker, which is a big advantage, or keeping the timestamp you first put on when you derive the image, and in which case you wouldn't need to match the timing, you can just all sort it out at the end, which would be, you know, be lovely. You know, we've been asked to quote for systems for 2110 for matching the audio to match the video delays. Well, you know, why delay the audio? Why not just wait at the end if one's before the other? That's where you need a little bit of storage to match them. But that's not what ST2110 is. At the moment. At the moment, yes, it might change. But mm -hmm. we can, uh, for equipment manufacturers, working with future standards is always tricky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yes, I mean, I think, I, I think, I think there's, a, there's a general um, a feeling that. Um, Perhaps some things were done in a way that was far too much biased to, to legacy SDI thought processes than actually what you, what you can do in IP. And I think that's um, uh, uh, some of that's going up, like your narrow wide debate. Mm. Um, the answer, if you're in IP, should be wide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that <coughs> is when people are looking at the cost of an IP system compared with an SDI. They're saying, how much would it cost to make an IP system mm. that's exactly the same as my SDI system? Well, if that's what you want, then there isn't a lot of point. Mm. But if you want to serve your media requirements in the best way possible, then IP is going to do that. And we've all got to think uh, one stage above it, SDI, what are we trying to achieve? And a lot of it's the same. You know, the camera manufacturers will maybe have a different output and you still got someone that's got to choose which picture and you've got to light it that doesn't change but for actually moving pictures around just like we've been doing with files for years there's some new opportunities with IP there's some things we need to know but you only need to know them there there's nothing that's can't be sold so I'm aware we haven't spoken too much about standards and uh, ST2110, but really on the network sides, whether it's 2022 or 2110, they're pretty, pretty similar issues. Um, there's a little bit about the wide and narrow isn't actually defined in 2022. I don't think it's in the standard, is it, Peter? Well, it's whether it should, how the packet should be distributed in no. 2020. No, we've, we've been reading 2110 standards recently, I tend to forget. Yes, yeah, so, um, but if anyone's got any 2110 questions, then give them to Richard, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just throw in a question about the narrow wide? Yes, can I pass your microphone? Yeah. In conventional, as you say, with SDI, you know what the data rate is, you can predict that. When you're into IP design for systems like this, where you're into bandwidth planning and making sure that your network infrastructure is correctly scaled for the flows that you want to put through it. Yes. Um, it's obviously easier for the simple mind to think, well, if it's running in narrow, then I know what my data rates are, therefore I know what my network capacity has to be to cover, carry a particular number of signals. If you work, work it when in, in wide and the, nat the nature of the traffic becomes bursty, does that then cause... Yes, you need a lot more capacity in your network. Oh, I'll let oh, Richard say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't become, but bursty implies that it's also unpredictable. Wide is no less, is as, as predictable as narrow. 
So the, the difference will be is if you've got, um, you know, your frame is that long and we're going to send out all the packets there. And, you know, the concern is that if I've got five things all trying to send all the packets at the same time, that I'm trying to fit five times that in that space of time. Whereas actually I've got this big gap over here. Um, if you space them out individually, then what you're really doing is you've got all those same five packets all occurring at exactly the same time. So actually there's still just as much conflict. And what you're relying on is there enough slight delay and enough slight buffering in your system to actually fan those five packets out. The wide approach is that, you know, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send all the packets there and then the next front piece of equipment, I would delay them all and essentially you time, time multiplex. So you send all the next five pack, um, set of packets there. So your five frames are all being sent I'm not explaining this very well. You have five pieces of equipment all trying to send out all of their frames in this amount of time. <laughs> but what you do is you tell each of those five pieces of equipment to start when they're not going to conflict with each other. And given that you've got PTP time in, everyone has the same concept of time. Therefore, it is trivial for the sender to say, rather than send out at start of frame, I will send out at start of frame plus a fifth. And in that way, to my mind, you're actually making a better usage of your bandwidth and your utilization because now all of those packets are absolutely not conflicting with these. The wide, the narrow approach where you've got all of those packets, yes, they're all spaced out, but they are still actually conflicting. So it's you're just relying then on your switches to have a slight amount of buffering and a slight amount of delay for it all to work. So it's, no, to me, I'm a, I'm a great f fan of the, the wide approach. Get it, if you've got it, get it out as fast as possible. Is Our equipment um, will do both, explain. and it's up to the system yeah. designer to choose how they want it. Yes, it does explain how yeah. Yeah. I think it's another of those things that IT is offering us a way of moving the data quickly. As long as you manage it, as you say, such that your network can take the data when you want to send it. Um, but uh, we, I guess our policy is keen not to ignore it. And if, if it can be take, used to advantage, then... We can, because it's be nice to get an advantage from IT systems to actually start seeing them rather than it just being a measure of cost as to that it can do things that we can't do with SDI. Yeah, I got a, I thought I was done. Yes. I guess. <laughs> Have we got any time left? Very briefly, though. What we, how we think IP should be done from a broadcast manufacturer is that we just have one board that we configure in various ways. Its heart is everything is GPU and CPU based. Strangely, we were working on towards this before we decided to do IP products because we thought this was a better way of making products that manipulated images anyway. And so we have a board that has various connections, SDI and IP. So when we um, make an IP to SDI or an SDI to IP, it's a software function and actually we sell it as software running on a hardware. And partly from a marketing point of view, the hardware costs a chunk and the software's smaller. It's obvious that you combine your software and make it do thing, something else without having to pay the new hardware. But um, so it is for us to start from scratch and we're still not shipping the products but hope to very shortly. But it's moving to software is in a way like moving to IP. It gives you some great things that you can do differently. Um, you know, GPUs are used for gaming, for scaling pictures and different resolution. They're brilliant for that sort of thing. Um, and that's the last slide of our stuff. So that's to say that various products, at the moment, they're pretty much the simple 
um, connection products. So on the left, we've, if you can't read it, it's 2022, direct SDI to IP and vice versa, and IP to IP, um, doing things that Richard was talking about. It, these are all going into the GPU, and obviously our future products, you choose what, uh, it probably won't be six channel, but you'd choose what connection you have in and out, and it will do whatever functionality. And it also means that we expect to be providing products that are both SDI and IP, and so you can move from one to the other. Because actually the soft, doing it in software suits us as well. Um, so, and I think we're as guilty of them. When everyone has their equipment ready, um, I'm assuming that people are putting together small installations will use IP because it's easier. Not just because it's cheaper, but it's easier and it allows them to get what they want to do. And it comes when you start fiddling with it. It is very strange that you never rewire anything. Once a device is connected to a switch, then it's... I know people say, oh, but with SDI I know where it is. But you have to go and find it around the back. Yeah. Whereas it's, it just connects to the network. You know, our, our network is all around us and we can put video in here and it will come out anywhere else. So... Um, so that's the story we're trying to say, and that was the point of the trivial system, is that when equipment's IT-based, you shouldn't be scared of it. Just put it together. I don't think I've got any more slides. Questions? Oh, do we agree that small... Yes. My insecurity, I'm trying to see, get agreement for you. Do people think it will be the way for small systems quite soon? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Still uncertainty, I assume then. Um, questions? So you mentioned earlier on uh, the idea of having one port that your video and your audio and your control and your data all goes through. Do you think that's really how systems will be built, or will you have a dedicated network carrying the video and a separate network carrying the control and data, which tends to be less predictable in nature. Yes, I mean, that is I mean, that's how, how our MSDI systems work in a minute. So like our, we've, we, we do a frame-based system, so we've got frames with cards in them, and the control for us goes through the frame. <laughs> um, and the cards do all the data. So in terms of network connections, there's a network connection to the frame which does all of the control and all of the monitoring. So, for example, those statistics that you were seeing there, yeah, we've got a web-based front end, but that's actually the statistics coming from the card to the frame, and the PC is connected to the frame. Um, and that's via a different connection. In terms of our company network for this demo, it is actually going down the same bit of fibre into the switch on a separate VLAN. Um, but so, yeah, short answer is yes, you want to separate control and data. Um, absolutely. It also helps, going back to the security side, is it allows you to really lock down your control because you might be that you may not have, for example, to have such high speed firewalls because the, you know, the, some of these data rates are huge, you know, many, many hundreds of gigabytes of traffic. So you may choose your security side, may just be a physical security. So you separate out the wiring and the control, use normal IT. Um, firewalls and pack inspection, all of those type of things. So yes is the answer. Yeah. Any more <coughs> questions? Have, have, you, have you done interoperability testing with your own products, with other people's products? Um, unofficially. So we've, we've got, um, so like some embryo, the embryonics do like a little SFP Thing. So we've tried our um, system with, with those. We've, as a company, we've not yet been to an interoperability lab, so we've not done the, the full test with lots of different people. Was but that we are. 2022 or 21? That was 20, uh, 2022. Yeah. No, we've not yet tried any of our 2110 stuff with anybody. The PTP stuff we have been. Um, we have mixed results, if I'm honest. Um, 
And the problem we've got at the minute is because we're still in development, of course, when it doesn't quite work. Is it our fault? Is it their fault? Is it the specs fault? Um, so that's quite slow going. Um, the PTP has caused us problems um, because actually some of the switches try to intelligently handle the PTP and we've been having problems with a man, well, this man knows all about it, why has he got grey hair? Because he's been dealing with PTP all the time and the switch was intelligently order, reordering the packet for us. Yeah, that was helpful. Um, use a switch that was less intelligent and the packets all come through nice and neat. Um, so intelligence doesn't always <laughs> help in this. Yes. Is there a, oh, Phil. sorry, was there a particular <laughs> issue that you... Uh, well, only that I think in our experience we found that it has been essential to prove, prove, to build a proof of concept and prove that all the devices we plan to deploy do actually work together. Yeah. Because the manufacturer's claim that it supports a standard doesn't necessarily mean it will work with another manufacturer's equipment. So the mm. proof of concept stage has been very important, and uh, yeah, doing those interoperability tests before trying to deploy a live system is, is essential, really, I think. Yeah. <coughs> exactly, because the standards are changing and say with all these different profiles and it's very new and it's quite obvious when you're reading the, the, the actual standards there's a lot of things they're not saying and you sort of think, you sort of you know, guess a little bit. Um, so yes, definitely didn't we? Uh, yes, so who's that? Operating models that are opened up in a facility. So an SDI network is inherently central. You've got to get everything back to the router in the middle. So that becomes the one thing in the middle. What I'm seeing with IP is more um, a distribution of that network and more local interfaces in different places. I guess that's a little bit like the, the marble interface that you described, and other vendors have got bigger ones that are then linked by IP. So I'm just interested in ultimately when people are going to choose to buy this have we started to think about the different uh, models of how a facility can operate with an IP network differently and better than with a centralised SDI network? Um, I, what you're saying is, will it become less centralised with uh, an IT? Well, I think, it, I think it will. It's more, if, if we say it's going to become less centralised with an IP system because you don't have a big router in the middle of the facility, or you don't have to, and what does that allow us to do differently, which might then create the whole reason for doing IP networks? I think it depends which manufacturer you talk to. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, th I think I would say that you're, it's not quite answering the question, but the, the thing about whether it's central or distributed, currently that, that manifests itself by having central control, but all, as in so the soft side of it, but also central hardware. As you say, all the signals go back to a central place and then come back out again. What IP gives you is you can absolutely work in that same model. You can have central control. The difference, though, is that the signals and their routing is distributed. So centrali centralising things is often very good because at one point it gives you one, one point where you can make a decision, is this the right thing to do? either for operational reasons or security reasons that we've been talking about. Um, so IP, but, so <coughs> SDI forces you down that path, you have no choice, so you can't really do distributed. In the land of IP, you can still do central control if that is what you need, but if you don't actually need that, then you can go distributed. So. I think what I'm saying is that IP gives you a choice, whereas SDI, you have no choice. Everything goes to the one point. So I'm not quite answering your question. <laughs> established facility to suddenly do IP unless there's a particular new requirement, a new capability that they have. Uh, you know, adding IP on incrementally might happen first to, to fill out the things that IP can do. Yes. But it will be identifying those new use cases that will drive adoption, I think. 
Yes, that's right. I think, I think it's much easier to see why if you were doing something new, there'd be no, in many ways, you'd be daft to go SDI. You know, look at our sort of silly example here. What we've done here is we've got eight fibres through the wall. And in terms of infrastructure, there was eight fibres between here and that end of the building. To do the same with SDI, because I'm... I can only send in four pictures, bad example. I could send a lot more pictures <laughs> than what I could with, um, with the fibre. So in that sense, it makes a lot more sense. Now, economically, like they were saying before, you now need IT people rather than someone to lay a whole load of SDI cables. But once those cables are down, you can't do anything else. So you can't change. And I think what IP gives you is just gives you that ability to change. I think you're right that there's not currently a killer application out there that's saying you can only do this in IP. I think not helped by the fact that the protocols currently are no more than SDI over IP. I think it's interesting that the early adopters of IP have been driven by non-technical reasons like facilities. So, for example, if you look at um, um, one of the big playout centres, it's gone out of my head, in, um, over in Luxembourg. They moved into a new facility where there wasn't the physical, it was a generic office block. They couldn't have put enough SDI cabling in if they yeah. wanted to. Yeah. And so they had to go IT. Same with uh, OB trucks. It's no, no surprise that OB trucks have become yeah. IT centric much quicker, I, IP centric. So yeah. I think it's some of those factors that ultimately drive adoption as much as the technical benefits. Yeah, oh, I agree. It's that sort of you know, earlier slide. Why would you invent SDI now? You wouldn't. You'd use IP. So it's only legacy. Not only legacy is a large reason why we're staying with SDI. I think the key to some of that is in the, the answer to that question is in the control. That's the first few IP points have been built on monolithic pairs of big switches that looks a bit like an SDI architecture, but as big orchestration layers mature and become more stable, the leaf spine architecture becomes available and that enables a more scalable, you, you can add to that without taking anything down and continue to develop and grow your network, whereas um, that was more difficult with the, the centralised architecture. Yes. So that's, that's, I think it's changing at the moment, people are moving from the big monolithic switches more to the more of the leaf spine distributed switching architecture. Mm -hmm. sure, thank you. Uh, so somebody's already mentioned PAL and going back into history it was very easy to convert a television studio complex from PAL to SDI by just replacing the router with a digital router because the cable infrastructure was already there. So what I'm hearing now is that uh, the coax cable infrastructure is now being replaced by IP. So my point simply is that going from PAL to SCI was easy. I'm not so sure about IP. But my main point is PTP has been mentioned many times. But I wonder where we are with things like grandmasters with hybrid uh, studio complexes where we've got six or seven cameras feeding in a mixer uh, some of which of the gear will not respond to PTP protocols and we need to get accurate timing of the mixer down to very small amounts. What work has already been done on proving the ability to replace what I've just said an SDI studio with an IP studio? You can <coughs> it's possible to sync black and verse to PTP. What you're saying now is we're retaining the old uh, sync if you, generator. No, if you say it won't work with PTP, you need to have some sort of legacy okay. system. That's the legacy system. Yeah. So you, you've got a grandmaster locked to tri level sync or whatever. Grand, no, you have a grandmaster locked to satellite. Yeah, and but it also tri outputs tri level sync. Okay. So has that, my point is, who's done this already? That's standard tech. Because we have. Do you want to see someone who's done? Yes, true. Yeah. Yeah. No one's going to pass it that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you pitch, John. No, no you're, you're quite right. I mean, the SPGs already exist with PTP. Yeah. Um, mm. All the major manufacturers now do it, yeah. including ourselves, Trilogy. 
uh, under Clearcom. So, as you said, Black and Burst, it was uh, something they said at NAB, wasn't it? You can sync Black and Burst and PTP. So we still have legacy reference signals okay. alongside yeah. okay. the new IP reference signals. Okay. Thought that's what it was. Thank you very much. And also those cables that they use for um, analog, it's about time they did replace them. And what is quite good obviously, once you're onto fibre where we've got a 10 gig network, to make it a 100 gig network is only changing what's on the other end, it doesn't change what's gone, gone through the roof, fortunately. <laughs> That's a good question, Nick, because um, it was on the mic. I say, yeah, how long will SDI systems be around or still being installed? Um, I'd be around, oh, probably all the time I'm still alive. But uh, being installed, hopefully that will change quicker. We're still converting people from analog to digital in some countries. So, and digital came out, I don't know, 1980. Or? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, 601 is seven years old. Yeah. And it's we're still selling to the BBC and they insist on using their equipment for at least 10 or 15 years. <laughs> 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 that's that's apologies good. to anybody here from the BBC. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you know it's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I've spoken to a number of broadcasters that replacing our equipment that's been there a long time, well, from their first change from analogue to digital. So yes, Nick, um, a while, <laughs> yeah. We've still got stock of uh, quite a lot of uh, SDI products. Um, is that all the questions? Okay, well, um, again, thanks to Roddy and Ipram. They're here if you want to ask them questions on control systems. It's their control system that we've been using today. And um, thanks to the SMPTE for well, so. helping us arrange this and putting it in their schedule. Yes. Uh, and to have people that are really involved with it telling us what's going on and with, and with some of us that have perhaps been around a little bit longer to say actually we had similar problems. Yeah. Um, it's also nice, um, I remember with uh, embedded audio the only firm that was able to uh, get it to work to the spec within under four hours was uh, Crystal Vision. And, you, and some of the industry leaders were still doing, we're sending it this way, we're receiving it this way, that's the way to do it, which is not what the spec actually said. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's an awful lot there. I mean, IP, uh, I don't find too difficult. Every packet counts. Well, that usually is quite easy because put an RTP in the header, so you, you know it counts. All it needs is just best practice. And that is something, yes, you can sort of vaguely just round some of the corners, but you can't really do it. And then, of course, it is complicated because when things go wrong, everything tends to, to work uh, and, and interact, as your lovely looped packets did. At least you didn't do as the BBC did. You just send all, all the Glasgow's traffic to Dumfries, and it sort of didn't quite get back again. Um, <laughs> But uh, this is the future. We've heard what's happening. We can see that a few steps have to be done before it really becomes easy. We also see that you can go out and buy the equipment now and have a bit of a play with it. You know, it is the sort of thing um, I, get, I, I used to get told off for having uh, equipment l lurking in and around my desk, as some people know. But it is something you, that in the office you can have sitting on your desk and have a bit of a play with. Um, and yes. IGMP and I think software defined network green will actually coexist. Um, but it's just a matter of knowing what you can do with it. And we've got a lovely demonstration here, so I'll, I'll let Roddy and Ephraim and uh, the guys from uh, Crystal Vision explain what's going on. Thank you all very much. Yep. And thank you everyone for coming. It's been a good turnout. I appreciate that. And I know some of you have come a long way, so <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs>